On the 25th of October 1999, at approximately 0920, a Learjet took off from Orlando, Florida for Dallas, Texas. His requested altitude was 39,000 feet. 27 minutes later, the pilot acknowledged clearance to climb to 390. It was the last known radio transmission from the aircraft. Following the failure of the Learjet to acknowledge calls from air traffic control, it was intercepted by several United States Air Force and National Guard aircraft at an altitude in excess of 46,000 feet as it flew northwestward. Shortly after 12.10, the Learjet was seen to impact the ground near Aberdeen, South Dakota, killing all six aboard. The United States National Transportation Safety Board determined the probable cause as incapacitation of flight crew members as a result of their failure to receive supplemental oxygen following a loss of cabin pressurization for undetermined reasons. In other words, both pilots experienced hypoxia following depressurization. History tells us that a number of other aircraft, both military and civilian, have suffered a similar fate. Before we look more closely at a hypoxia, let us examine the basics. Commercial aircraft usually cruise at between 22 and 44,000 feet above sea level. Hypoxic and hyperbaric conditions would be lethal at these altitudes without pressurization of the aircraft cabin. How is this achieved? Air is compressed in the aircraft to obtain a cabin pressure equivalent to that found at between 5 to 8,000 feet and is known as the cabin altitude. Aircraft operators generally keep the cabin pressure at around 8,000 feet. Most aviation authorities around the world require supplemental oxygen to be available to passengers and crew if operating above 10,000 feet. Hypoxia is one of the most important consequences of high altitude exposure. In general, it's the lack of oxygen to the brain and exists in four different types, anemic, stagnant, histotoxic, and the most common in aviation, hypobaric. No matter which one occurs, the outcome is always the same, reduced oxygen to the brain. Let's briefly look at the four different types of hypoxia. Anemic hypoxia involves a reduction of functioning circulating hemoglobin. This type of hypoxia appears in persons suffering from anemia or blood loss. It can also be caused by carbon monoxide, which configures the hemoglobin so it carries less oxygen. The body is effectively put at altitude before leaving the ground. Combining the effects of smoking with cabin altitude puts your body at a higher altitude than the pressurized cabin. Stagnant hypoxia is the result of a reduction in the total volume of circulating blood because of shock or the pooling of blood in the extremities during rapid acceleration. Blood pooling can lead to blackout or loss of vision and unconsciousness. Histotoxic hypoxia results from the poisoning of the tissue enzymes that render tissue cells unable to use oxygen. Some medications can influence oxygen in the blood and care should be taken, along with the appropriate advice sought, before flying. For example, taking two aspirins six hours before flying can destroy 30 to 60% of one's tolerance to hypoxia. Hypobaric hypoxia is the most common type found in aviation and is the reduced ability of red blood cells to carry oxygen because of the low oxygen content of air at high altitude. Symptoms appear when you are exposed to an altitude that requires oxygen and you are not wearing an oxygen mask or your oxygen mask or system is defective. It has been found that lower altitudes produce hypoxia more slowly, while higher altitudes hasten the process. It's a given that the most effective way to alleviate hypoxia symptoms is to breathe 100% oxygen and to descend to below 10,000 feet. In aviation, we may divide hypoxia into severe acute, usually the result of sudden cabin depressurization, mild, the hypoxia experienced in normal flying, and insidious severe. 
Severe acute hypoxia might come from a door or window blowout. Mild hypoxia in normal flying, by this we can only refer to cabin altitudes of six to 8,000 feet, doesn't normally affect healthy pilots or cabin crew. However, any compounding factor, such as excessive fatigue, poor sleep associated with mental stress, a common cold or simply feeling unwell can seriously exaggerate the effects of the usually non-serious hypoxia that comes at around 8,000 feet. The main symptom is that of feeling tired. But it is insidious severe hypoxia that flight crews should be most alert to. It usually occurs slowly and or insidiously, resulting from mechanical failure or pilot error. It is the fact that the pilot doesn't know it is happening that's important. The reduction in cabin pressure and resultant hypoxia is severe. The pilot, unless he or she recognizes the symptoms, succumbs to a non-functioning state. By being alert and knowledgeable, both pilots and cabin crew can recognize it and therefore deal with it before it's too late. A sudden reduction in cabin pressure at altitude reduces the transfer of oxygen to the bloodstream quickly, affecting both brain and eye. The first effects on the brain are problem-solving, decision-making, judgment and self-criticism, often with the individual fixating on one task at the expense of all others. With continued exposure at high altitudes, the individual may suffer confusion and disorientation accompanied by lethargy and either euphoria or dysphoria. Further effects are incoordination, slurred speech, a coarse tremor, leading eventually to loss of consciousness or convulsions. The effects on the eye can be loss of color perception, blurring or dimming, sometimes accompanied by a tunneling effect and impaired night vision. An early sign and symptom of hypoxia stems from a condition known as cyanosis. The skin or mucous membranes and fingernails can display an abnormal bluish or grey colour arising from deoxygenated haemoglobin, the oxygen carrier in the bloodstream that carries oxygen from your lungs to your tissues. Cyanosis is also associated with carbon monoxide poisoning a not unknown threat to pilots working in general aviation. It is when a chemical agent blocks the ability of haemoglobin to bind oxygen, the treatment for which is the administration of pure oxygen. Simply put, we might say that if you feel strange in the head or unwell, it could be due to hypoxia. Severe acute hypoxia can affect a person to the extent that they become helpless, requiring the assistance of someone else, which, if not forthcoming, will eventually lead to a loss of consciousness. Time of useful consciousness, or TUC, is the name given to the point where an individual is no longer able to recognize and correct the effects of hypoxia. TUC varies with altitude. Close to two billion people travel in commercial aircraft each year, including people with chronic cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Recognizing altitude-related hypoxia and oxygen requirements during air travel are of crucial importance in view of the frequent transportation of individuals with poor cardiopulmonary reserve. Passengers with cardiac problems are also at risk of ischemia and arrhythmia due to hypoxia and its resultant activation of the sympathetic system. The pre-flight assessment of individuals with cardiac and pulmonary disorders is the function of a qualified physician. However, once in the air, the task of assessing and treating such an individual may fall upon the crew. Most passengers do not have any sort of medical check or assessment prior to flying, and the elderly, particularly those over 80, irrespective of their medical condition, will be affected to some extent. Cabin crew need to be alert to this, particularly on any flight in excess of one hour. A sympathetic response to hypoxia stems from good, sound training. There is no substitute to knowledge when treating passengers for hypoxia, particularly one suffering from cardiovascular or respiratory disease.
As long as aircraft fly above 10,000 feet, the potential for hypoxia will exist. As has been said, there are no new lessons to be learned, just old ones rehashed. Those who fly as aircrew should be familiar with the aviation life support equipment on board, whether in the cockpit or cabin, and conduct proper pre-flight checks. As a crew member, you should know the symptoms of hypoxia and what action to take. Think hypoxia. The next time you feel strange or unwell, whether working in the cabin or the cockpit, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that it won't be hypoxia, but at least think it.